All right. So welcome to the session. The topic of this presentation is harm reduction approaches to high risk drinking and alcohol use disorder. Before we get started, we're gonna go through some quick statements of acknowledgement and disclosure. This material is made possible through a financial contribution from Health Canada and the General Practice Service Committee, which is a partnership of the government of BC and the doctors of BC. The views expressed here do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada or the GPSC. I'm Alana Hirsch and I will be the speaker today. I'm a family physician. I specialize in addiction medicine. I work with PHS Community Services in Vancouver's downtown east side. And I run a clinic one day a week at the Drinker's Lounge, which is a peer run community managed alcohol program in the downtown east side. And I'm a clinical assistant professor at UBC. I have no relationship with commercial interests to disclose. The BC ECHO team would like to disclose financial support from Health Canada and the GPSC as presented on this slide, as well as in-kind support from the BCCSU. And the BCCSU is also providing an honorarium to me today for my participation. So I'm disclosing that as a potential conflict of interest. Steps have been taken to mitigate potential bias in the program. So all the content has been reviewed for potential bias, validated by members of the Independent Scientific Planning Committee and approved for accreditation submission. So at the end of this session, you should be able to define harm reduction in the context of alcohol use, explain how harm reduction approaches are part of the continuum of care for patients with high risk drinking and alcohol use disorder, summarize harm reduction strategies that can be incorporated into patient education about alcohol use, and describe managed alcohol programs and discuss emerging evidence. So before we talk about harm reduction in the context of alcohol use disorder care, we're going to do a general definition of harm reduction. So from harm reduction international, harm reduction can be understood as policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. Harm reduction focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that they stop using drugs as a precondition of support. So this is just a quick review of the alcohol use disorder clinical pathway, which has been discussed in previous ECHO sessions. Each of the steps in the clinical pathway can be viewed through a harm reduction lens. Withdrawal management can be viewed as a harm reduction strategy, even in individuals who consume high amounts of alcohol, as it can be used as a break from alcohol consumption. Even if it's temporary and relapse occurs, it's still useful to give their liver a break from metabolizing high amounts of alcohol. Pharmacotherapy options can be used as part of a harm reduction strategy by aiming to mitigate alcohol cravings and relapse. Psychosocial and community-based supports can also help to reduce alcohol-related harms by helping individuals overcome social barriers which may be related to alcohol use. These are just some examples of how harm reduction is integral to the alcohol use disorder continuum of care. Harm reduction is an evidence-based approach in alcohol use disorder care that has been shown to significantly improve the health and quality of life for patients with alcohol use disorder. A reduction in drinking can improve a number of clinical outcomes. Engaging patients in harm reduction approaches is also an effective way to meet them where they're at and can lead to increased retention in care. It can also increase engagement with other health care and social services, which can help improve other physical or mental health issues or social determinants of health. Patients who initially adopt harm reduction strategies to reduce drinking may over time develop additional treatment goals, which could include abstinence. Although harm reduction may be thought of as separate from treatment, I prefer to think of it as a complementary approach. Patient education about the harms of alcohol use can support patient autonomy in choosing their goals relating to alcohol use. When providing this education, it's important that we be non-judgmental, but still frank and honest. We need to assure our patients that alcohol use disorder is extremely common and encourage them not to feel ashamed about their alcohol use. 
We should provide information on the long-term harms of alcohol use and the benefits of abstinence. While patients should be informed of the benefits of abstinence from alcohol, this education should be provided with the recognition that this goal may not be desired or feasible for all patients. And we need to let them know that even small changes to their alcohol use can have some benefit to their health. Clinicians should also help patients understand how physical and mental health effects they are experiencing are connected to their alcohol use. Discussing the disease progression of alcohol on the liver can be especially helpful. Advising people how there's a progression from fatty liver to inflammation to fibrosis and cirrhosis and letting them know that at many stages along the way, changes to the liver can still be reversed. Once they get past fibrosis and into cirrhosis, it's much more difficult and increases their risk of having carcinoma. Alcohol use also has many other potential health impacts as shown in this image. Long-term effects can include neurological effects, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and pancreatic disease. Clinicians should help patients understand the connection between the health issues they may be experiencing and their alcohol use. So even if a patient comes in with lots of bruising or bleeding from their gums, I try to inform them about how that's related to their liver having difficulty making clotting factors. Patients should be informed of the effects of alcohol use and how harm reduction approaches can help to minimize those effects. Once patients are informed about their alcohol use, clinicians can work collaboratively with them to develop attainable goals using harm reduction approaches. For some patients, that will include evidence-based treatment with a goal of reduced drinking or abstinence, but for others, they may not be interested in treatment, but they may still want to reduce the harms associated with alcohol consumption. Some examples of harm reduction approaches that can be introduced to patients with alcohol use disorder include reducing overall drinking, for example, by reducing the total alcohol consumption or number of drinking days per week, connecting patients to resources to address inequities in the social determinants of health. For example, connecting them to housing or social services. Supportive pharmacology, in addition to all of the other medications that you have learned about to help uh, deal with cravings related to alcohol, we should also prescribe thiamine to patients with severe alcohol use disorder to reduce the risk of developing Wernicke's, Korsakoff, and beriberi. Safer alcohol use strategies and managed alcohol programs will be discussed in further detail in the next few slides. So safer alcohol use strategies are a great way to tailor alcohol use related goals to each patient. Discussing ideas for safer use of alcohol can engage patients in care and help them set attainable goals. Some examples of safer alcohol use strategies include alternating alcoholic with non-alcoholic drinks, eating before or while drinking, consuming beverages with a lower alcohol content. So letting our patients know about the existence of low alcohol level beer or wine, or suggesting that they dilute their drinks with water or other non-alcoholic beverages. Some people who cannot access alcohol turn to illicit or non-beverage alcohol, which has a much higher alcohol content, things like hand sanitizer or mouthwash, and therefore a much, much higher risk to their health. Uh, if it's available in your community, you can refer patients to illicit alcohol exchanges. We have one in Vancouver where they can exchange non-beverage alcohol that they've acquired for safer forms of alcohol for consumption. Setting a drink limit before starting to drink can also be useful and people can use strategies to keep track of the number of drinks they're consuming. Uh, there's apps that exist like Saying When, which we can provide a link to in the post-session materials. There's a number of visual and online tools that can help patients identify lower alcohol drinks and help them keep track of the amount of alcohol they're consuming. This infographic is from the University of Victoria's Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research. Visuals like these can be beneficial educational tools for patients. They can also be helpful for clinicians who are trying to determine how much to prescribe someone who is starting a managed alcohol program. Some additional safer alcohol use strategies include planning non-drinking days, not drinking and operating vehicles, tools, or machinery, drinking in a safe environment. In Vancouver, we have the Drinker's Lounge, which provides individuals with a safe space to consume alcohol in. 
connects them with a community of other individuals who consume alcohol, helps them access medical care or engage in skill building. But supervision could also simply mean having a sober friend who agrees to get them home safely. Avoiding drinking while using other drugs. It's very important to ask our patients with alcohol use disorder about any polysubstance use. For example, if they use opioids, it would be really important to make sure we offer them substance specific harm reduction, such as take home naloxone kits and training and letting them know that they might be even more vulnerable to overdose if they only use on occasion because they don't have the same tolerance as regular opioid users. It's worth noting that injectable naloxone might be difficult for people who are inebriated to use because it requires a certain amount of dexterity to draw up naloxone into the syringe. So if it's possible, I prefer to prescribe intranasal naloxone for people who drink. Managed alcohol programs, also called MAPS, are a harm reduction strategy targeted towards individuals with severe alcohol use disorder. In this intervention, small amounts of alcohol are dispensed to participants at regular intervals. Some MAPS may include medical services on site to engage participants in additional medical care, and they should always be staffed by trained trauma-informed people who can help make MAPS a safe space to drink. The goal of MAPS is to reduce high-risk alcohol use, such as high levels of consumption or consumption of non-beverage alcohol, and to engage heavy drinkers in care. MAPS can be offered in community settings or in hospital. MAPS in the community settings often run in conjunction with housing services. However, they can be separate as well. Individuals who are homeless or unstably housed may particularly benefit from MAPS. There's currently a limited evidence base for MAPS. However, it's growing. The research that has been done on MAPS so far suggests that they can be a useful harm reduction strategy. Studies have shown the participants in community-based MAPS have a reduced number of standard drinks per day compared to newer MAP participants and controls, reduced non-beverage alcohol consumption, fewer self-reported alcohol-related harms, so less physical health issues, less social problems, and less emergency visits. They also cite improved engagement in medical and psychiatric care. A review of hospital-based MAPS found that this intervention was superior to standard withdrawal management protocols, for example, CIWA, for preventing withdrawal symptoms in hospitalized patients with severe alcohol use disorder. Further research and guidance is needed to support implementation of MAPS. The Canadian Managed Alcohol Program Study is run out of the University of Victoria and has a number of useful resources about harm reduction in MAPS. For example, they have a number of useful infographics like this one about safer drinking tips that you can share with your patients. Uh, the webpage with these resources is referenced at the bottom of this slide and will be shared in the post-session materials. In addition, BCCSU developed a resource for implementing managed alcohol for vulnerable populations during the COVID-19 pandemic, which I recommend taking a look at, and that's available on the BCCSU website. In summary, harm reduction aims to minimize harms associated with alcohol use rather than eliminate alcohol use itself. Harm reduction is an integral component of the alcohol use disorder continuum of care. Clinicians should incorporate harm reduction approaches, including safer drinking strategies, as they discuss alcohol use and related harms with their patients. And managed alcohol programs are an emerging harm reduction strategy for alcohol use disorder for which further research is needed. If you are providing addiction and substance use care and require additional specialist support, the BCCSU is now offering an addiction medicine clinician support line, which is available every day of the year, 24 seven. It connects you with experts in addiction medicine who can help with challenging situations in your practice. So please feel free to access it at the phone number that's listed on this slide. And if you need more information about it, you can find that on the BCCSU website. Uh, there's lots of references that were used in the preparation of this slide. And you can find those in the alcohol use disorder guideline from the BCCSU. Thank you so much for your attention.
Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I work for the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, and we have a group at this organization called the Eastside Illicit Drinkers Group for Education. Um, this group has been together for about 10 years. Um, if you don't know anything about Van Du, it's a peer-run organization. There are about four staff. Uh, as I mentioned, this group is about 10 years um, into its work. Um, and so this slide kind of really shows what was happening around the time when uh, the group started. Um, you can see that in Vancouver Coastal Health, um, most of the ER visits were related to alcohol. Um, I asked St. Paul's to give me some information on this at the time, which I haven't followed up with in the 10 years, but um, it was like $300,000 worth of um, ER visits only of people who had the uh, postal code from the um, V6A, which is the downtown east side. So a significant amount of money is going towards sending people to hospital. Um, and a lot of them are coming from groups like the Edge Group or for the Drinkers Lounge, which didn't exist at this time. Um, so these couple of slides here are slides that were created by drinkers. Um, we have started a group uh, with policymakers and other healthcare providers in the downtown east side in Vancouver to create an alcohol strategy for Vancouver. We found that in the last 10 years, it's been very difficult to get funding policies or programming started related to alcohol because alcohol isn't taken seriously as an issue for people. For some reason, when we talk about harm reduction, we really focus on um, opioids and other substances, which is an important topic. We should never forget that. But there are many people who use alcohol. Um, if you look at some of the stats around overdose deaths, depending on the population, uh, people who have alcohol in their system at the time of death is usually between 25 to 45 percent. So um, it is a big issue. It's something we should be talking about. Um, so we asked uh, drinkers at the drinker group, which we have about 80 people, but our meetings are about 30 at a time, now less because of COVID. Um, questions like, what are the biggest issues you feel like when you're trying to drink safely or when you're trying to get treatment, which we kind of think of as the harm reduction model where people need to go to their doctor or go to their clinic or their social workers and say, I, I have an issue right now. I have stuff that I need to work on. Um, and for some people, the recovery model is abstinence and helping that person get to that place is really important. And for other people, it's just getting to a safer place of drinking and reducing their harms. And what we found from pretty much everyone in the group is when they're trying to do either of those things across the spectrum, it is very difficult. There are very few resources and they are not supported. And so um, we asked those two questions and these are some of the answers that people had. Um, I think uh, a big thing around drinking safely is like being able to be in a safe space. And so some of that is having social places where people can be. Um, I think a lot of services think of uh, people who drink as people who might not be appropriate to be in their services when they're under the influence, but uh, we found at uh, the Drinkers Lounge and at um, EDGE that when people have a role in creating the programs and the rules, they're able to control their drinking, they're able to uh, be able to behave in a way that's appropriate for a service, and so I think there's a lot of stigma that uh, is associated with this group. Oh, sorry, um, I think that's the next one. So uh, I'm, if you wanna read these slides completely, you can, and you can always ask me for them. I'm not gonna go through every point, um, but uh, criminalization is a huge thing. I think uh, we've really seen this in COVID era. Um, I think a really common uh, Antidote that we have in the downtown east side is that, you know, if you have the money to spend $8 and go to a really fancy patio in Gastown, you're allowed to drink outside. But if you don't have any money and are down the street at Pigeon Park, you're going to get arrested for publicly drinking. So we've created these um, rules around drinking, but mostly they end up just criminalizing people who are homeless or have more issues with alcohol. Um, and we found that people have had alcohol from the drinker's lounge, which is clearly a bottle that is made from there. They are part of a managed alcohol program in which they have been getting a prescription from a doctor, et cetera, and their alcohol is taken away from them and they are receiving tickets for drinking publicly. Um, they're not 
drinking publicly more most often because they want to is because their SRO doesn't have guest policies that allow them to have guests because they're a drinker or because it's COVID. Um, the parks they used to go to are no longer open, like Oppenheimer Park. Um, when they go to bus stops, they get harassed by the police. So by pushing them further and further into very marginalized areas, we're seeing more and more deaths of people who are asphyxiating on um, their uh, vomit when they're overly intoxicated or they've fallen and hit in their head and have uh, brain injuries, et cetera. So these things are really dangerous and are all connected. Um, so I kind of want to talk more about treatment. Um, I think that people who are doctors and clinicians probably have some idea about this, but the, the system in which we are providing people to access treatment or go to detox is very, very broken. And when you're very vulnerable and want to make changes in your life, um, and you're told that you have to wait two weeks, three weeks to go into detox, three months to go into a treatment center, the treatment center that you've been waiting for to get into um, suddenly closes because of COVID. Um, and then you have to wait another six months or whatever it is, is very difficult for people and can completely throw them off their um, trajectory to their own recovery. So, um, I would highly recommend more people continuing to come to these sorts of talks where people understand the uh, nuances of addiction medicine, but also the, the struggles that people have to try to just get the care that they need. Um, oops, sorry, next slide. So uh, I could go through all of those in detail, but what I would like to highlight is that um, having community, having services, having people is really important to people who have been marginalized for a long time and have like a really severe alcohol use disorder. Usually they're distant from their family or other related things. Um, these three men are men who have passed away in the last year due to COVID uh, restrictions um, in my mind. So that's obviously not a causation, but um, you can see over the history of this group. So in 2010, um, there was a huge drop in beds at one of the shelters that was low barrier. And we had a huge amount of people pass away in that year. I think we had 10 deaths in six months immediately after the closure of the uh, beds. They went from like, I think 150 to 60 beds. Um, then if you fast forward to, I think about 2017, um, that was when the drinkers lounge had to move locations because their office um, lost its funding and they had to find a new location. It took a couple months. And during that period, I would say we lost about 15 people. Um, and then if you fast forward to now during COVID where restrictions have been made, where we can't have as many people in the offices, uh, both at drinkers lounge and at edge and other services, day talks was closed for a while. Some people don't know where smart meetings are. Um, I can count personally uh, 20 people that have passed away, um, including one of the members of this group. Um, he's the man in the middle there. His uh, Facebook name was Ron Luce Kitty Cool K, but his real name is Ron Cool K. Um, he was a committee member for this uh, ECHO and has been a part of the um, ECHO team, the BCCSU Alcohol Use Treatment Guideline. Um, and many other research projects. Uh, it's been a hard year to grasp how many people have uh, passed in this time period. And his death was quite recent. It was in the last two weeks. Um, so I think many people wouldn't know that it happened here. Um, but I would say that like, it's something to think about. Uh, being there for people, even just as clinicians to say, I'm here no matter what, I, even if you fail the treatment model that you wanted to do, we're here, we'll work on it, we'll figure something out, is a huge thing and probably could be a lifesaver for people. Um, so I, I, I didn't have very much time for this. So if you want more information on EDGE and any of the research we've done, the collaborations with um, CISURE on all those safer drinking tips and guidelines. Um, these are some of the things. And if you want to research, uh, reach me, that's my email at the bottom. And um, yeah, thanks for having me.